live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the inside scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Good evening and welcome to the inside scoop. I'm your host tonight, Melissa Bachelor Murphy, and we're continuing with our healthcare series. If you're interested in shows we've done in the past or shows that we're going to do in the future, you can visit my website at melissabphd.com. Tonight we're going to be talking about inpatient geriatrics and the consultation services that geriatricians can bring to hospitalized older adults and to their families. I'm joined by Dr. Denise Mohes. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for having me. So maybe we'll just kind of start by talking about um, what type of extra training you had to become a geriatrician. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking. So after medical school and residency, I did my residency in internal medicine. Some people do inter uh, residency in family practice or family medicine. After that, you do a fellowship. But usually it's a one-year fellowship, learning the geriatric syndromes like constipation, incontinence of different, you know, urinary incontinence, bowel incontinence, dementia, delirium, and all of the things that really impact older adults. You spend one year specializing in that. Some people do two years, where one year is a research year. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. And then, so um, how many geriatricians do we have? So that's the problem. Um, in the U.S., we know that the, po the population is definitely aging, and we do not have enough geriatricians to keep up with the aging population. A couple years ago, there were maybe 7,500 of us. I think that number has been dwindling. So what are the challenges? Why, why would, I mean, I love older adults, mm -hmm. um, so I so can't imagine I. it being right. a, a challenge, but mm -hmm. what are some of the challenges that, that you face in geriatric medicine? So there are some big challenges with recruiting people to this specialty. Um, I think for one, you know, the compensation for taking care of older adults is not as elaborate as some of the other specialties like cardiology or orthopedics and surgical specialties. So when you think about the compensation being less, that's one thing that impacts um, our ability to recruit people to this specialty. I think the way healthcare is morphing, the way we're able to care for patients, for example, in the outpatient arena, a follow-up visit is 15 minutes, a new visit maybe half an hour. When you have an older adult with maybe five medical illnesses, hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, you know, osteoporosis, and, or many other things, it's hard to do that and do really good care in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. So if we can't do really excellent patient care, a lot of people shy away from that specialty. Yeah, typically a primary care visit is around 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and that's just that's never been enough time right. to work with a, um, an older adult and their mm -hmm. family. Um, so um, we're going to talk tonight about some of the inpatient services um, that you um, offer at ANOVA and mm -hmm. within the ANOVA healthcare system. Um, so maybe you can just talk about how would a family member or another pr provider on your team know that it's time to call the geriatricians? Mm -hmm. So we always actually try to keep older adults out of the hospital. The hospital is not a great place for older adults. Many complications arise in the hospital just of the nature of the decreased um, physiologic reserve that older adults have and the high risk of complications such as infections. If you do, if an older adult does end up in the hospital, then we want to take really good care of them and try to get them back to their baseline functioning level and, and baseline functioning health. If there are things such as delirium, which is acute confusion in the elderly, which I know we're gonna have a whole segment on delirium. Um, you know, so someone might say, things just aren't right today, mom's not behaving the way she usually does. That would be one reason to get a geriatric consult. I think delirium is probably the most common reason that we get consulted on the inpatient service. The other things may be agitation and behavioral issues. So sometimes sleeping too much mm -hmm. or agitated and you know pulling at things and pulling lines out or just really confused sometimes there's complex pain in older adults and pain medications have to be navigated and titrated ever so gently in older adults because we don't want to cause any complications so geriatricians are specialists in providing pain management and other non-pain um, symptom control in older adults constipation is a big one i think yeah. we were chatting earlier about constipation and that's one of the biggest things that causes a lot of problems for older adults but it often goes missed because we're not talking about the bowel movements yeah i've told my students um, 
Constipation gets no one's attention, yes. but diarrhea definitely does. Right. So. Uh, the other thing sometimes with older adults, they may have loss of appetite or weight loss, loss of strength, recurrent falls, you know, ambulatory dysfunction. They're unsteady with their gait, and a lot of times these things are just, well, you know, you're getting older, so it's a part and parcel of that, but it really isn't. So the geriatrician is able to work with the primary care specialist to try to figure out if there's something reversible that we can fix. And sometimes it's something that's easily reversible, and sometimes it's not, and then we need to figure out what community resources are available to optimize function and hopefully get the patient back home. Because unfortunately, mo maybe more than 35 to 40 percent of older adults that come into the hospital even though they came in from home end up going now to a skilled nursing facility or a rehab facility and that in itself has its own complications and so we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can on a hospitalization to prevent complications and hopefully having that um, older adult patient get back to, to home and health. So specifically, what are some of the strategies that you use as a geriatrician to minimize those complications? I think for one thing, we start with a really comprehensive assessment, kind of head to toe, more than just a regular history and physical exam that you would do for a regular adult that comes to the hospital. We want to know definitely medications. We spend a lot of time going through the medications kind of one by one, comparing the medications that the patient may have been taking before they came to the hospital with what medications they're taking now and then planning for what medications that they may need when they leave. Even things like the over-the-counter medication often mm -hmm. gets you know, overlooked, but some of those over-the-counter medications can be interacting with medications that we may have to use in the hospital. Yeah, and same with herbs and supplements. I think that people Correct. think that you know, herbal remedies and homeopathic natural um remedies, mm -hmm. they don't really understand that they can interact with traditional things. Correct. So making sure that they bring in, we call it the brown bag approach, mm -hmm. Put just throw everything in a bag and bring it to the hospital so that somebody can do this comprehensive look at all of it. Yeah, and I think what also happens is sometimes you're taking multiple medications, but some of them are the same medications with different names. Mm -hmm. and well, and that was a thing, I was talking to my mom last week, and mm -hmm. everything now comes out with a generic name. Right. And she's like, what is that? And then mm -hmm. I can tell her the brand name, and she understands. Right. So for ex I think one of the biggest things we have sometimes, a high-risk medication would be something like Coumadin, which is a blood thinner. Some people call it warfarin, right? So you have the same medication by a different name, and you could imagine if someone is not aware that it's the same medication, you might be doubling your doses. Right. So one of the things that the geriatrician really does is spends a lot of time going through each medication and working with our partners, for example, in pharmacy, yeah. to make sure that they're not drug-drug interactions, because I think adverse events with medications are one of the biggest problems we have with geriatricians, yeah. with, well, with in, geriatric in healthcare, patients. Yeah, in healthcare, the American Nurses Association put out something last week and said that medication errors are still the number one problem um, right. within healthcare. And for an older person, I mean, the average number of medications is at least five, maybe ten. Yeah. I if had you're a only on five, you're doing <laughs> right? good. I had a patient in clinic last week, 27. Yeah, and, and it was and not doubling meds; it was just 27 meds. Yeah. So um, talk about what you would do with some. <laughs> what did you do in that situation? I think the first thing we always try to do is to see if there are some of these medications that we really don't need. Yeah. The um, in geriatrics we tend to say less is more for sure, mm -hmm. um, and then also start low and go slow with building up the doses of these medications. We often have some of the complications that patients come to the hospital with, or during their hospitalization issues that arise, or because of medications and the treatment is not to add more medications the treatment is to actually take off some of these meds right and you know you can cut that med list in half mm -hmm. and the person just comes back to life and you're a miracle worker right. and it and it really that we're taking away things not necessarily adding yeah well um, doing talking to families about the risk and the benefits so right. my grandmother um, has a, some mild dementia but was also falling mm -hmm. and was on Aricept or forget the generic I know the brand name yeah Donepazil yeah, so she was on that medication, and at 88, that medication isn't going to improve her cognitive ability or even stop it or slow it down, mm -hmm. but it could be making her dizzy. Mm -hmm. So talking to my parents, or to my mom, to say, I think we just need to get rid of that particular medication, and th I think those are the types of insights that people in 
geriatrics have to right. offer families. And I think also the older adult, just by the aging physiology, the way your liver and your kidney processes these medications, which is the way these medications are excreted from the body, the physiology are just so different that sometimes medications that may have been well tolerated before, there may be a you know, small change in the function of these organs and it causes bigger um, adverse events. And also you think when you have an acute illness in the hospital, you were getting treatments for maybe an infection. So we now are adding an antibiotic on top of that. And some of these antibiotics may interact with your heart meds. And so we just really have to be careful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was, as you were talking, I was like, and most of the trials done on medications I think one of the, uh, the yeah the exclusion <laughs> criteria is if mm -hmm. you're 65 and older. Mm -hmm. So you basically have these medications that have been released to the public, but weren't actually tested on people over right. the We're age. We're extrapolating have, yeah. to the best of our ability. Um, I think the other thing that a lot of um, that I tend to see a lot in the hospital is patients who may have been losing their appetite. So with normal aging, your taste buds get flattened. The way you taste food really changes. Um, sometimes your medication also affects the way you taste food. Dentures or you know ill-fitting dentures may affect the way you're able to chew. Your appetite decreases for many different reasons, but some of it may be reversible and some of it is normal aging. You think about if you're no longer as active, for some patients they're more sedentary now, they're not as active, your caloric requirement is lower, so you start decreasing your appetite. Well, some people, you know, they're losing their muscle mass as a normal part of aging, something we call sarcopenia. So all of these complications uh, arise. Some of it are because of aging and it's normal, and some of it is really because of a different illness. So frailty starts coming in. Patients are at risk for falls. I think the other thing is sometimes they start losing weight, and we think, well, it's just normal and you're aging. But sometimes it may be other things, right? We, depending on your age, yeah, malignancy. Really, there are so many different factors that come in, and we're able to help kind of pull this through and then determine, based on advanced care planning, how far do we go with our investigations and how aggressive are we with working up some of these things? And and when do we, you know, decide? Well, maybe we need to just palliate some of this. Yeah, I think one of the things you mentioned too was having time to do that comprehensive assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to pause here for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, when we come back, we're going to talk about the Hospital Elder Life Program, which is a program around delirium. And then Dr. Mohes will be back um, towards the end of the show to talk about a new program going on at ANOVA called No One Dies Alone. So we will be back in just a few minutes and continue our talk about geriatrics. Hi. You think you're probably sober? Yeah. But you're thinking about taking the back roads home, just in case. If you're probably sober, then why would you do that? Good choice. Probably OK isn't OK. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. That's a full glass of wine. I'll be chatting you later. Hey, Gabby, how you doing? How was the play date and sleepover? Dad, it was great. Awesome. OK, I'm on my way. Hey, guys, what are you doing? We're going swimming. We're going biking. Yeah. I'll see you in a little bit, guys. I love you. Hi, babe. How was school today? Hi, Dad. It was great. OK, honey, I'll be home soon. Remember, you're never too far away from your kids to be a dad. Reach out and take a second to check in, because sometimes the smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life.
We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Good evening and welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Melissa Bachelor Murphy, and we're continuing with our healthcare series. So tonight we're talking about inpatient geriatrics and some of the innovations in care that we have in the area and kind of are beginning to pop up around um, the country. So I'm joined now by Ms. Susan Heisey, who's a social worker by background, and you're here to talk to us about this program that's called HELP. So right. what is HELP? HELP stands for Hospital Elder Life Program. Being in, in the hospital can be very disrupt your normal routines. So coping with these changes and plus the stress of illness can really slow patient recovery. Uh, Dr. Sharon Inouye 15 years ago developed help when she was at the Yale University of Medicine. She's now at Harvard and uh, director of the Aging Brain Center. This program helps to prevent people from declining uh, functionality, mobility, as well as preventing delirium while they're in the hospital. This, um, over 200 hospitals worldwide now have the Hospital Elder Life Program. And it uses a series of activities, uh, daily routines, medical reviews, to keep people alert and mobilized to prevent the delirium and function decline that often happens when patients are in the hospital. So maybe we'll stop right here. And okay. maybe, so the term delirium, I think it might be something that we use a lot in our world, and I think families probably recognize delirium, but what does delirium mean? Delirium is a change in your mental status, your normal way of thinking. It's really a brain injury. And for the typical patient who's 70 and older, there are 100 patients that come into the hospital, 25 of them will already have delirium when they come to the hospital because of the stress of illness. Mm -hmm. Another 25 will develop delirium, and this is what this program is here to do, is to prevent that from happening. Which is great. Um, I know that some of the articles that I've read about delirium is that it's missed in like 86% of cases, and you know, it's like, why are we not picking up on this? And I think it probably goes back to what we were talking about with Dr. Mohes about if you're older, people tend to not see a change in your mental status as a medical emergency versus if it was a child in the bed that was delirious, everybody would want to investigate that. Correct. And there's two types of, actually three types of delirium. Uh, the more con one of the types is the hyper active delirium where people get very agitated. They often will pull out their IVs, try to take their clothes off. They sometimes see bugs on the wall. But the more common and the problem is the hypo uh, delirium, which can be more serious. And then sometimes people get a mixture of the both. But the hypo people get very uh, lethargic, sedative. It's easy for staff to miss because people are very quiet. But this yeah. delirium can be very upsetting for families because this is a sudden change and it can change throughout the day also quite frequently. Yeah, I mean, it's not normal to sleep through the day and sleep through the night. Um, or to change from morning to night, from where you're sleeping to where you're, you know, out of control. So um, I relate this back to hypoactive is kind of your constipation, <laughs> and it doesn't get anybody's attention, but the hyperactive, people pay attention. Correct, that's right. So what specifically, how does this program work? What does help look like in a, in a day? Sure, we look at the patients who are 70 and older as a starting point, and we're looking at six known risk factors that can cause delirium. Coming in with a dementia or cognitive impairment puts you at greater risk for developing that throughout your hospital stay. Having dehydration, uh, being immobile and having vision and hearing impairments as well as sleep deprivation. All of the research has shown will call, put you at greater risk for developing delirium during your hospital stay. So we provide services three times a day to patients seven days a week with specially trained volunteers. Um, they will walk with patients, they will do range of motion, they will provide hearing devices or reading glasses, help with meals so people do, are not uh, dehydrated. We do various therapeutic activities that will engage patients to think and be cognitively active, maybe looking at the newspaper and talking about current events. All of these are low tech but very high tech touch and make a very big difference for patients. Yeah, they really do. And um, I think that a lot of times in our healthcare system, we're kind of all excited about all the technology and advances and we, um, it's kind of like smartphones and we lose that ability to, con to connect with, a, with another person. That's right. 
and our, our volunteers get special training where they get, in addition to the normal hospital orientation that all volunteers get, they get a, an extra 25 hours of specialized training with ongoing uh, skill checklists. And now we're using the simulation lab at Fairfax to uh, retrain uh, our volunteers. So they get uh, online training and practice, and then they shadow experienced volunteers for an additional 12 hours. So what are, what's some of the content that you would cover um, in that extra, that additional training? Um, all the interventions that we do, we want to cover that. We also cover the making sure that the volunteers understand the difference between delirium and dementia and depression, since we are looking to prevent that. It's called the 3D. The 3D is correct. Okay, so um, if I w was interested in being a volunteer, what type of person are you looking for? You have to be at least 16 years and older and willing to at least commit for a six month period of time. Um, someone who obviously likes to work in, uh, with older patients, who can be work independently, take instructions, and also like um, be able to communicate with both patients as well as staff. So how often do the volunteer, I know you said three times a day, so is, is that the same person or you kind of have a shift where, like for a certain number of hours and? They come in for a three hour shift, so each patient gets a different uh, volunteer during those three times. Okay, and they, and they so the time commitment's day. three hours for the days that you volunteer. Right. And how many, do you have, is there a certain number of days that you have to? Once, volunteer? once a week. Okay, that's once the minimum. for six months. Mm -hmm. Once a week, okay. Um, so we've talked a little bit about why delirium, how to recognize delirium. Um, so what are some of the, po the outcomes that you've seen from this mm -hmm. type of program? Yes, and in 2014, we did a large study at one of the Innova hospitals, and we showed that there was a clinically important re reduction of delirium that occurs in the hospital, 57% reduction. We also showed that the nursing knowledge of delirium and dementia doubled and there was a clinical significant decrease in the number of sitter hours that were needed for those the help patients. And at uh, last year in 2016 at Fairfax, we estimated we saved over, there was a large uh, decrease in the length of stay, and over $550,000 reduction. Um, yeah, so, and that's another thing, I mean, just when you go, when you enter a hospital, if you have a diagnosis of dementia already, mm -hmm. you are more likely to be there twice as long as someone who doesn't have dementia going into that. Right. So, um, so how much did you decrease that length of stay from like seven days down to like three or four? Um, it was... I think at least a one and a half day length of stay okay. reduction. We Which for, if you've been in the hospital, a day and a half is, is very significant. Yeah, it is. <laughs> we also reduced the number of sitter hours and readmission rates also for patients. They were below the national, premier national standard uh, and national average. What we're really proud of too is that the program has been uh, at Fairfax Hospital for the last 10 years and we have never had any falls for any of the help patients while they were in the hospital. That is, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, and that's a patient safety issue that we just talked about um, mm -hmm. on our last show. Right. So you've mentioned that the program is currently in Anova Fairfax, and I thought I had seen... Uh, Anova Alexandria Hospital also. Okay. And we're hoping to be able to, uh, we're on seven units at the Fairfax Hospital and one unit at Alex, and we hope to expand in the very near future to more units and to more Anova hospitals. Right, well there's certainly a need for it. Um, over half the people in hospital beds are over the age of 65, um, and so we'll have to see how many of those are over 70 yes. also. Um, so what else? What else about help? Well, if you're interested in volunteering, we always are interested in, we'd love to have you as a volunteer. Um, if you go to anova.org backslash help, will is our website and we'll give you some information about volunteering yeah and also on the um, on my website melissabphd.com I'll have the link to get more information about the help program mm -hmm. um, I believe dr. Anyway was here um, a couple of months has it been a couple of months already um, and was speaking so maybe you can tell me a little bit about her visit what was that like kind of having the developer of this program I with said, you? Um, on her an, uh, advisory uh, board with Dr. Sharon Inouye and one of the eight worldwide centers of excellence for the HELP program. Right, so, and, and that's, that's kudos there, one of eight worldwide programs right. for, you know, with HELP, so just wanted to take a moment to 
enjoy that accolade. <laughs> We're very proud of that. Um, she came and, sp and presented at the um, Medicine Grand Rounds on delirium mm -hmm. and gave us a great uh, update on the latest developments, the risk factors, how prevalent it is in the hospital, and, the, and how the HELP program uh, helps really prevent delirium. And there is quite a lot on, if you go to her website, the hospitalelderlifeprogram.org, you will see there are over 500 articles on delirium and what has been published about some of the outcomes. Yeah, and what's really interesting about that, I mean, I typically, basically, I've always practiced in the nursing home setting, but I was looking at the minimum data set, which is basically the comprehensive resident assessment that's done on every resident that goes into a skilled nursing facility. And under the delirium section, it had um, the confusion assessment method, which is the CAM. Right. Um, so that was, it's always interesting to meet the person that's making that big of an impact. And this is an international program because regardless of where, you're, where you are, when uh, being older and being in the hospital puts you at greater risk for, for developing delirium. So this program is located in Canada, and Australia, Singapore, Ireland, Germany, France, Italy, Netherlands. It is definitely a worldwide issue for all yeah. the patients. Well, and obviously an effective intervention. Um, so what would a typical day kind of look like for a volunteer? You mentioned they have a three hour mm -hmm. kind they, of block. They will come in, they will pick up their list of uh, patients there to see, and they'll give them, on that list they will look at uh, and be able to read what they are supposed to be doing with that patient. Some patients they can help with meals, some will be doing walking. Um, so it really very basic because every patient, this is a free program for patients. Yeah, I was going to mention that too. And today, every patient. Which is very rare in healthcare absolutely. today. Absolutely. It's a free program and every patient gets individually assessed based on the risk, their risk factors and what their needs are. So based on that assessment, which is done by the help staff, they will determine what interventions the volunteers carry out. So they will come in, they'll, they'll collect the supplies from the help office, what they need to do, work with that patient, and they will go up and visit the patients. Each and every time before they see the patients, they will call the nurse to uh, let them know about the visit and getting up critical up medical updates. They'll visit with the patient, and then they always call the nurse afterwards to close that clinical loop to let the nurse, how they walked or what they ate, that type of thing, which is very important for nurses, especially as they pass that on to the next shift of nursing staff. So great. Well, thank you very much for explaining um, the HELP program. When we come back, we'll talk with um, Mark, and he has, um, is an help, a HELP specialist and has experience with this program. And just want to give kudos to ANOVA for making the commitment um, to older adults and improving their care by offering this free program known as Hospitalized Elder Life Programs. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments. It doesn't really matter. Every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Hey, did you know that 2.4 million loving cats and dogs in shelters and rescues need our help to find a home? Go to the shelterpetproject.org and search your local shelters and rescues. Go for a cuddle with your next best friend. Adopt. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. We cannot be bystanders. We can stop to make sure someone is okay. We can warn someone when their drink isn't safe. And disrupt the situation. We can. Get someone the cab. Or walk them home safely. We can make campuses safer for our friends. Our roommates. Our, our classmates, classmates. Our, our fellow, fellow human, human beings. beings. We cannot be bystanders. We can. Intervene. It's on us. All of us. Learn how and take the pledge at itsonus.org. When it comes to saving money, ah, what? Scary. Don't act like a baby. Oh, it's like they're having their own little meeting. This is so humiliating. Be the boss. I'm the boss. What the? Mm. Power nap. You were saying, and make a budget. Let's get to work. Need a little help? Stacy, read back the notes. I can't read. 
What's it say? Create a personalized savings plan and get other tools and tips. We can share. You obviously didn't go to business school. At feedthepig.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Good evening and welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Melissa Bachelor Murphy, and we're continuing our healthcare series. And tonight we're talking about a new program, or it's been 10 years at ANOVA, um, called Hospitalized Hospital Elder Life Program. And I'm joined now by Mark Kassab. Hi. And thank you for being here this evening. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Yeah. So you're working with the HELP program, but maybe just take a minute to tell us about your background, because um, I'm always curious about how other people come to love working with older adults like I do. Okay. Um, I started out as a volunteer in HELP before I was employed by them. Um, I kind of gravitated towards the HELP program because it seemed like one of the only programs that allowed you to be independent and work by yourself um, and really get to, to test yourself in a clinical environment. Um, right now I'm in the process of applying to osteopathic medical school mm -hmm. and it, I think it's, it was a great decision. It really prepared me for it. So um, how much did you know about delirium before you started working with the program? Well, uh, first of all, how did you hear about the HELP program? So I, um, I wanted to volunteer. Uh, I heard about the HELP program actually through a friend of mine, um, but I had no idea how, how intense it was going to be. I mean, we get 25 hours of extra training, um, and they really train you to, to uh, you know, be with a geriatric patient, but uh, I, I didn't really know what I was getting into coming in. To be honest, I didn't know much about delirium at all, but now I, I'm able to educate other people, which is fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So what was your background that you were looking, like, what were you, you were obviously you're out of college. So I have, were you uh, in school? I had a history degree actually. And then. Which is great for working with older adults, by the way. It's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it really excites me when they tell me they, you know, voted for Eisenhower or something. That's really exciting to me. But yeah. um, science is, is also a passion of mine, I'd say more so. And uh, the HELP program really kind of was the first step that I took when I committed myself to the, to the medical school path and trying to get in. Um, because I thought, you know, if there's one program that will really test you and make, make sure you have what it takes, it's, it's this program. Um, you have to think on your feet. You uh, have to deal with all kinds of problems. People come up to you asking you to, you know, I want to make a complaint to the hospital. Well, what do you do? Uh, so it's really great, you know? I'm, You're not that kind of help. <laughs> no, I'm not that kind of help, no. I can point you in the right direction, though. Yeah. Oh, and they, always, they, they would always ask you, they would say, something, you know, can you take me to the restroom? And, and we're not allowed to do that, but I am. I'll get someone that can. I mean, you really just have to be in a respectful way, and you don't want to ever make someone feel like they're not being taken care of, so it's great. Right, I man. I think one of the benefits to being a help volunteer is that you can help to meet some of those needs that might take longer to be met. If mm -hmm. someone's got to go to the bathroom and everybody on the floor is busy, mm -hmm. you know, at least you can be another person mm -hmm. you know, to go get someone. Absolutely. I mean, nurses in hospitals, doctors in hospitals, they, they are already so, so overwhelmed with the amount of work. Um, and I think help is a great reminder that, that medicine isn't just treating an illness, it's caring for the entire person. Uh, and help is kind of that touch that does that, you know? Um, so without it, I think a lot of patients, you know, might have not even recovered as fast because your emotional state is actually a big part, mind, body, and spirit is, is. is something that's very important, so. So were you nervous when you first started working with, I mean, I know yeah. that older adults can be a little scary. Yeah, no, they're not scary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, I was, I was pretty nervous, especially the first time I went out, because you're about to be alone with a vulnerable person for the first time. And what you'll find is that when you stop thinking of them as patients and start thinking of them as individuals, uh, it gets so much easier. You just have a conversation with them. What are your interests? What are your likes and your dislikes? And it stopped being scary after the first couple times. Yeah. The art of social skills. The art of social skills. This, this program will teach you the art of social skills it, with multiple people too. You've got to talk to a patient in lay terms, but you're also interacting with nurses and other clinical staff. So. So it sounds like if someone's interested in kind of going into the healthcare professions, mm -hmm. that this particular volunteer experience, if you only have to be 16, I mean, someone as early as a junior or senior in high school, um, do you have volunteers that, that young? Or? We do. 
um, the, the, we just ask that they're able to get themselves to the hospital on time. Um, we, we, we do take high schoolers. Uh, we find that sometimes high schoolers have a, a harder time letting go of the idea that, oh, this is an authority figure. Um, you really just got to talk to them person to person. But we do take high schoolers, yes. And we have, I don't know, right now we have about five. We used to have 15, but a lot of them went off to college. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. and by authority figure, you mean just kind of that generational gap, that Absolutely. respect for elders, but realizing that you can... Yeah, when you're in high school, every adult in your life is telling you to do something, you know, except yeah. for the patient. Um, and it's, it's, it's difficult to start thinking of them as a person in need rather than someone that's telling you to do something. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. And figuring out how to initiate the conversation and to ask mm -hmm. the question. So it sounds like there's a little bit of leadership training. There in is. There too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you start picking up social cues, you look around the room, it really helps you you know, develop the skill of how to figure a person out before you actually talk to them. I mean, if I go in and they have picture of, pictures of their dogs everywhere, I'm going to start talking about their dogs. Um, if they're watching politics and I'm feeling brave, I might jump into a political discussion. <laughs> so, so yeah, definitely some leadership, definitely some, some critical thinking involved in there, yeah. And your history degree helps also. Yeah, but you don't need a history degree to volunteer. True. <laughs> Um, so you went from being a volunteer to mm -hmm. now working with the HELP program. So what was, what's the difference? Like what do you do now for yeah. your work? So the overall goal is the same, trying to help patients. But now I manage about, about 40 volunteers. I manage their schedules. I screen and enroll patients uh, by assessing them, uh, first on the computer and then face-to-face. Uh, I'm also doing data, uh, analyzing our outcomes. Some of the outcomes that Susan was talking about, we worked on those together. Um, other than that, uh, you know, any, any sort of managerial volunteer program, I mean, you get calls like, I can't make it today. So it's a lot of schedule filling, but I still get to interact with patients, which is my number one passion, I would say. So, so how do you feel like this particular experience and now this, this job is going to mm -hmm. inform kind of your development um, as a physician? So I think the biggest thing that this volunteering experience has taught me is that there's so much in the classroom that you just can't learn when it comes to healthcare. Um, a person isn't just a bunch of symptoms. A person, like we said earlier, has mind, body, and spirit. And I think that this program really shows you that the most effective healthcare is given when you treat all three at the same time, uh, which in that parallels osteopathic philosophy perfectly, which is really one of the reasons I decided to go into that. So, Yeah, so how about um, favorite stories? There's one. Um, well, I can, I can tell two. Uh, one of them, this, uh, this gentleman didn't really have anything to do. So he was watching old westerns. And I had finished my shift a little early, so I sat down and I said, I'll, I'll watch a movie with you if that's okay. And he said, yeah. And this guy was predicting every, everything. This guy was saying, he's going to marry her. He's going he's gonna to fall off a horse and die, all that type of stuff. Uh, so there are funny moments, too. Him and I were, were laughing a lot. But then there was a really touching moment that I actually want to talk about. The, um, the most touching moment I've ever had was there was this woman, and her husband had recently passed away. And she wanted to listen to a song that reminded her of him. She had a smartphone, but you know she didn't really know how to how to Google it, uh, and she said she left her her cassette player at home. So I just I made her a little list on her phone with all the links and um, gave her some headphones, and she started crying. And she was saying, you know, I I didn't think I would be able to hear these songs again, and now I needed them the most because I'm in the hospital. And it just showed me right there and then that. Um, you really do make a difference when you try. You, you know, just going out there and, 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 and doing something small. So for me, Googling songs is, is nothing. But for her, it was a really big thing. And now she has those songs on her phone. So. Yeah, so one of the things we were talking about in the uh, first segment was kind of this difficulty attracting people into geriatrics. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that that, we, that I didn't get out is mm -hmm. it is one of the, they are the most fulfilled of mm -hmm. all of the specialties. Absolutely. Um, geri geriatric patients are a hilarious, B wise. They can talk to you for forever, and it's always interesting. Um, on top of that, you really see that that a geriatric patient um, simply, you know, isn't is any different from a normal patient besides their age. Um, they are more vulnerable in, in some aspects, but 
you know, it's it's uh, once you once you take that first plunge, you will probably be the most fulfilled. I would say, uh, at least compared to other specialties, um, because you really feel a connection with that person. So. Yeah, and I think having as a volunteer, having the time to listen mm -hmm. to that person and kind Absolutely. of what are they worried about, what mm -hmm. are their fears, mm -hmm. and being able to then take that back to the healthcare team because um, we can kind of get caught up in well, we need to treat her blood pressure and mm -hmm. constipation. They're like, I remember one person that was really focused on getting their advanced directive in place, yeah. and her biggest goal for the day that there was a fish fry and I yeah. need to help her get a plate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They want to feel like they're cared for, uh, not just being treated. And yeah, everyone that comes in at ANOVA, I think it's an average of 13 visitors a day uh, into your hospital room. So when that one person comes in that says, I'm not here to talk about any anything medical, just how was your day, how are you feeling? Is that your dog? What's your favorite music? Um, they'll really love it and they'll take to and they'll appreciate you and they won't forget you. I, I, we've gotten letters, we've gotten notes um, and you're just taking a little time out of your day. I mean, three hours a week, that's not much yeah. to make a difference. So it kind of gives a completely different a completely different spin on the term personalized medicine. Absolutely. It's a, yeah, personalized medicine, not not in terms of genetics, in terms of actually having a personal connection with the, uh, with the person. Yeah. yeah, you can use that on your I will use that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, so any challenges? I mean, you've talked about how it's rewarding, and mm -hmm. we've talked a little bit, so. Mm -hmm. um, patient agitation was always something that scared me, uh, walking into a room and, and being yelled at by a patient because, you know, they don't know who you are. Family members will be very protective sometimes, uh, but the challenges always turn into rewards if you can learn from them. But, but that, that scared, and it, you know, having been a volunteer for about two and a half years, just statistically, it was gonna happen. Yeah. Um, but the first time it happened, it wasn't so bad. Yeah, and I think when I said that older adults are scary, what I mean by that is if you come into a situation like that mm -hmm. and you don't know what to do, right. that that's when it's scary. Yeah. But, you know, so what within your training helps you to kind of navigate yeah. that situation? Um, so the first thing we always tell our volunteers is to make sure that they know that you understand what they're going through. Um, at the same time, try not to, to val especially if they, you know, Oh, food services here isn't very good. You don't want to be like, yeah, they're terrible. You don't want to say that, but um, you want to understand why they're frustrated. You want to make them them know that you're going to try to do something about it. Uh, and then, you know, advocating for the patients. A lot of times you go back and they'll say something like, you're one of the only people that I feel like has actually tried to help me. And it's not because other clinical staff doesn't want to help. It's just that that's what we're there to do. And uh, the burden that um, other clin clinicians have is so high, so. Yeah. Um, and anytime someone's acting badly, I always say there's always some unmet need there. Absolutely. So thank you for being with us no and sharing problem. your experiences. No and when we come back, we'll continue talking about some of the other innovative inpatient um, programs at ANOVA and geriatrics. There's more than just books at the library. Il n'y a plus que de livres à la bibliothèque. Hello. We have a lot of great books here today. You know there's more than just books at the library. I know. There's more than just books at the library. I don't want to be hooked to a machine. I want all the medical treatment available to me. I wouldn't want my family to have to make this decision. My doctor knows what's best for me. An advanced directive is your life on your terms. Talk with your family. Decide what's right for you. Then put it in writing. Documenting my wishes today means my family won't have to make heart-wrenching decisions later. To learn more, visit www.putitinwriting.org. 1,200 American youth run away from their homes every day. The National Runaway Switchboard is here to help. 
1-800-RUNAWAY. If you are a runaway, thinking about running away from home, or a parent or guardian concerned about issues facing your child, call us 24 hours a day. 1-800-RUNAWAY. In times of crisis, hope is just a phone call away. 1-800-RUNAWAY. To the inside scoop. Here again, your host. Good evening. And I'm your host, Melissa Bachelor Murphy, and we're continuing our healthcare series. Um, so Denise, Dr. Denise Mohes is joining me again, and we're going to talk about a new program at Anova called No One Dies Alone. Mm -hmm. But before we do that, we left. We were just discussing that we left out some critical information in our first segment. Right. We kind of talked about some of the challenges of recruiting people into geriatrics. So. Maybe you can just tell me yeah. why people should go into right. geriatrics. Um, so I think that's really important. Um, I, even though there are many challenges recruiting people into this field, and there may be challenges that we may not be able to easily overcome, I can definitely tell you that I agree with what you said in the previous segment, that we are the happiest, most fulfilled people in maybe any specialty. We just love spending the time listening to our patients, really hearing the patient's story. The patient's story allows you to care for them and overcome all of the medical challenges that they have, building relationships with the patients and their yeah. families. I think that's the most rewarding because you are providing that personalized, patient-centered experience, family-centered care. Because we don't only take care of the patient, the patient is just one member of a family, their caring unit mm -hmm. is equally as important. And I think that's one of the reasons we have the No One Dies Alone program. Yeah, I, mean, I would just reiterate mm -hmm. one statement that building relationships, mm -hmm. um, that is one of the main reasons I wanted to, to go into geriatrics is because you have the chance to work with people over you know, five years, mm -hmm. 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're in a hospital and people are coming and going every two to three days, you don't get that per sense of um, connection. And, right. and I think a lot of what we talked about tonight has been that human connection that mm -hmm. geriatrics brings to the table. Mm -hmm. So speaking of that, um, sometimes we don't have a lot of resources as we age. And mm -hmm. so maybe just give us an idea of, of kind of what the No One Dies Alone program is and why you think it's important for ANOVA to have to start this. Yeah, so No One Dies Alone, that this is a national program. It's in 300 hospitals nationwide and over 800 um, institutions internationally. Okay. It was really important for us to bring this type of program to ANOVA because we are a destination hospital. We're a first class you know, level one trauma center, and we do high, you know, degrees of interventions, whether it's transplants and ECMO and really fancy things. But I think what we also do well is to be able to provide that, you know, personalized care every time, every touch is what mm -hmm. we see. And for me, I also do palliative medicine and I do geriatric care. And I sometimes do have patients that are dying. As much as we have a death-defying culture in America, yeah. um, well, there's, patients yeah. do die. Yeah, there's one thing about aging, everybody's doing it, and mm -hmm. the other truth is no one gets out of here alive. Right, and so we wanna make sure that if we're providing excellence in care from birth, we're recognized for our pediatric and our neonatal programs, we also wanna make sure that we're taking care of patients of the other you know, most sacred time in life, which is yeah. during the dying process. I have found that many patients come to us for cure because we have some of the best providers and best programs, but sometimes they don't make it. Sometimes they do unfortunately die. We have patients flown in from all over the area because we're a regional center, and people are flown in, for example, after a trauma, and they're not able to survive, but their families aren't able to get here. Or they may have come from a different country and their family's not able to get here for multiple reasons, and they're here going through the medical care alone and sometimes dying alone. And it's very hard for me as a physician 
to know that there's a patient dying alone. And I've spent personally many hours just sitting with these patients, just providing quiet presence. Sometimes it's conversation, sometimes it's a hand massage, and sometimes it's just quiet presence because they're not able to communicate with me. Right. And so we thought that we needed to bring a program like this where we're providing excellence even at the end of life. And so the other way I've heard that framed in my own practice is to tell families um, and even patients, so while there's no longer an option for us to cure you, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we can't take care of right. you. We always care. We, they, they, we never say there's nothing more we can do because there's always something we can do and that something is caring but maybe in a different way. Right. So how, so I think this is a new mm -hmm. initiative mm -hmm. for you? Yeah, so. so this is a new initiative. We actually haven't launched yet. Today was supposed to be our launch day. Um, it's been delayed trying to get some of the red tape and the policies approved. This program has been kind of in the works for three years getting it launched and we're almost there. Um, it's a collaboration really with many different stakeholders in the hospital. Everybody realizes that this is really important. The health program who just uh, presented, they are one of the stakeholders because they are the experts and volunteers right now at Innova. Um, we have you know, the volunteer program. We have chaplaincy. Nursing is one of the biggest supporters for this program. Our um, C-suite, they all realize that we need to do excellence in, in care. Even some of our surgeons are saying, you know, they have patients that are dying alone. Can we bring something like this? So we have a lot of stakeholders all partnering to be able to bring this program to Innova. We have already trained 40 volunteers um, to just sit vigil with patients. Mm -hmm. Just quiet vigil or to be able to engage patients if they're able to be engaged. And I think part one of the other things that came out earlier is that sometimes we can encounter things that are scary mm -hmm. to us. So what are some of the, th but when you know how to handle a situation, it's less scary. Right. And then as you get more experience, you develop you know, a competence mm -hmm. around that. And a so comfort level. Um, I think dying could be scary. Talking about dying can be really yeah. scary. Yeah. A lot of and people won't talk about it because they're afraid it will happen. Right. Like, and um, we have recruited, so at Innova Fairfax Hospital, we have a bank of about a thousand volunteers in many different volunteer programs. And so we rec started recruiting just out of our volunteer bank. And we've had many volunteers who want to volunteer with this program, and they may be volunteering with other uh, programs as well. Some of them have already volunteered with their church community, sitting vigil in nursing homes. Some of them experienced a vigil when one of their loved ones was dying, for example, with hospice. Some people just want a way to give back. Mm -hmm. And we have found so many people, we have more volunteers than we, we need right now because we're starting with a pilot program. Mm -hmm. But so many more people want to give back in so many different ways. And some people want to donate their time to actually sit vigil. And we have people volunteering to have, you know, knit blankets for patients who may be dying. So it's a gift that we can give to them. Yeah. So speaking of that, what is, um, like, what if someone wanted to donate? You mentioned people donating time. Mm -hmm. um, and so what are some of the, sounds like it's a program that's kind of going to be funded and kind of sponsored through mm -hmm. donations, but it's still a free service just like help is right. um, for anyone that comes to your hospital. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the other yeah. things? That so this is for this program, when you think about it, is for patients' prognosis or who the physicians deem may be in the last 24, 48 hours of life. So what we want to create for these patients is a nice, comfortable, peaceful space to allow a peaceful transition as pleasant as it can be. So we think about prayer squares, so it doesn't have to be a religious blanket or where people pray, we, it's called a prayer square, but it's really maybe a small knitted or a little crochet square or some people donate a blanket. Um, many church communities who have maybe crochet groups are interested mm -hmm. in donating things like that. Something that we can just allow to comfort, that it's not a hospital gown or a hospital blanket. Uh, the other things would be little tea lights. We're not allowed to have flames with actual candles in the hospital. Right. So tea lights, you think about, um, we wanted to create you know, something around like aromatherapy, creating pleasant smells, whether it's lavender, 
So we're getting these little um, wipes from Amazon. It's like lavender wipes. So from infection control, we can't walk from a, with a bottle from room to room, yeah. but we can take one sunny wipe, you know, that has a nice lavender smell that we can create again a pleasant environment. The other yeah. things that the volunteers would be using would be, you know, most likely their smartphones to get download music that. You know, sometimes we think about tranquil music, harp music and things like that. Some people do not like that type of music, right? right. They want the big band music or jazz music or whatever really made yeah, them happy. You're celebrating life. Right, celebrating so. life and whatever really is what's personal to this person. So we have some patients who have no family members that are going to benefit from this. And we also have some patients who might be dying, but the family members live far away and they're not able to come to visit. Either they're in a different state or they may be as close as West Virginia, but it's really hard. It's a long drive with the traffic. Mm -hmm. So they, we may be able to reach out to them. They can tell us personalized stories. What can make this time and, and this space more personal? And we're happy to try to recreate that in any way. We are being funded through donations um, mm -hmm. and philanthropy. That's how we were able to get started. Innova has bought into it. Um, but I think this program really would be run on philanthropy. Uh, on the Innova website, we have a link, um, and we would be able to share the link on the Innova website that you can donate directly to No One Dies Alone. If it's a general donation without the specification, it goes to kind of this general fund that the hospital can use for anything. Okay. Uh, but we are definitely encouraging people if, if they would like to donate cash or kind, um, that they would specify that it would be used for the No One Dies Alone program. Yeah, and so after, with each of these segments, I tend to do a blog, and so we'll make sure that that information is on the melissabphd.com right. website for this segment. Perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and then if someone wanted to volunteer, is it the mm -hmm. same process as the other programs? Right, so you go through uh, the main volunteer screening, um, through ANOVA, and then through that you can say, specify that you want to volunteer with a No One Dies Alone. Because we're on our pilot, we had two trainings already. Each training session is four hours, really dealing with the signs and symptoms of dying, getting um, volunteers comfortable with some of the things to anticipate, you know, change in skin color, yeah. change in breathing pattern, things like that. So we've done uh, two sessions already, and we have another training session coming up in about two weeks. For our, train, for our pilot program, we're going to be between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. just for us to work out the kinks with the system itself. And we really hope within the next couple months to be able to launch a 24-hour service because if we're saying no one dies alone, our hope is that really no one dies alone. Yeah. Because not everybody dies in the daytime. Correct, during regular working <laughs> hours, right? Yeah, yeah and I, really, I think this is a great initiative and it's really important because historically what's happened with death in this country is that people used to die at home. Mm -hmm. And people don't die at home anymore. Right. They die in hospitals or mm -hmm. they die in nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And you can't always have somebody with you. So. Right, 70% uh, uh, of patients who complete an advanced directive would like to die at home, actually only 30%. So if they're coming to the hospital, we got to take really good care of them. Yeah. So again, another stellar program and a stellar initiative <clears throat> around geriatrics and end-of-life care and palliative care. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. If you'd like to see this show and others, you can go to my website at melissabphd.com. Otherwise, we'll be back next month to continue our healthcare series with Inside Scoop.